I am AP Townley, and this is Roleplay Culture. Are dogs really man's best friend? Uh, uh, that? No! No, no, go, no, buddy. You tricked me! Who doesn't want a fuzzy little furball to cuddle with? Or maybe something with scales. Who am I to judge? Maybe you want a tweety little bird or a massive Malamute. Whatever the case, pets are wonderful. But can we replicate that in D&D? Can we give our favorite characters adorable pets of their own? And how would we go about doing that? So here are five ways to get pets for your characters in D&D 5e. Number one, just buy it. This might seem like an obvious solution to some, but it's where we start. You want an adorable beast to tear the faces off your enemies? Just buy it. If we look at the mount section of the player's handbook, we find some interesting creatures for sale. That's right, for sale. No spells required, no class features or feats. This one is simple. We just buy our pet. In particular, the Mastiff, I think, is a good choice. Because man's best friend. I am personally bereft of man's best friend. Instead, I am graced with three little kitties, which are definitely woman's best friend because they certainly like my wife more than they like me. The Mastiff costs only 25 gold. Sure, it only has five hit points and an AC of 12. But you can boost that AC to 16 with a Pressplate Bardy without sacrificing stealth. They only do 1d6 plus 1 damage with tax, but they do have that wolf's ability to knock enemies prone with it. Yeah, they're not going to be combat powerhouses, but they can still have their use on the battlefield. Plus, it has a plus 3 in perception, as well as keen hearing in the smell feature. They can get quite the tracker and guard dog, which is probably what we'll use it for most of the time. Just make sure to have the animal handling skill to help control your pooch. And of course, there are other options on the list. Several types of horses, and even these guys. If that's not enough, then I urge you to check out this third-party book, Stibble's Codex of Companions. It has a robust rule system from where and how to find friendly animal buddies and how to tame and train them. A clear indication of what you can command them to do, and even leveling them up. There are all kinds of tricks you can teach them, and there are even rules on feeding and taking care of the little beasties. I will admit, there was a lot more Pokemon influence in this book than I was expecting, but as long as you're okay with that, it's a pretty interesting book. They don't sponsor us or anything, I just thought this was an interesting way to improve animals that are taken from the wild. Number two, Find Familiar. That's right, this one gets its own category. The Find Familiar spell is much beloved by those playing D&D. It's a ritual spell from the wizard's spell list. It takes an hour to cast and costs 10 gold for the special incense that is consumed. You get to choose a creature from a list that includes cat, spider, seahorse, or my personal favorite, the owl. You get this creature as a familiar permanently until it dies, or you dismiss it. This familiar can't attack, but it can do a bunch of other things. You can see through its eyes, making it great for scouting. And even though it can't attack, it can deliver touch spells for you. It can take other actions too, in particular to this conversation, the help action, giving advantage on attack rolls. If you need to hide your familiar or keep it safe, well, that's okay. As an action, you can stash it in a pocket dimension. And with another action, you can bring it out, you can bring it back out within 30 feet of you. This is such a versatile spell, and it's a ritual. You can add 10 minutes to the casting time and cast this spell without using any spell slots. Sure, it costs 10 gold every time you do that, but that's not too big of a burden. If you need to explore an underwater cavern, then turn your familiar into a fish for a measly 10 gold and send it out spelunking. So how do you get this spell? One way is to just take a level in Wizard, as this spell is only on their list. It's especially good for them because it's a ritual, and wizards and their spell books are uniquely suited to rituals. But there are a few other ways to get this spell if you're creative. The Eldritch Knight Fighter and the Arcane Trickster Rogue subclasses allow you to take spells from the wizard's spell list, one of which could be fine familiar. The Feats Ritual Caster and Magic Initiate can also provide this spell with Magic Initiate giving two cantrips and a first level spell to the user, which have come from the wizard list and therefore be fine familiar. Ritual Caster lets you use rituals and you pick two from a chosen class list, which we can add more of those later on. And if we choose the wizard, well, 
we know what we do, don't we? Warlocks get a similar feature at third level with one of their pact boons, the Pact of the Tome, along with the Eldritch Invocation Book of Ancient Secrets, which basically gives you the same thing as Ritual Caster. Or just cut to the chase and take the Pact of the Chain and get Find Familiar directly, which could also be used to summon more powerful familiars such as Imp or Quasit. And these familiars could attack as well. We'll discuss these a bit more later on. And finally, there are certain backgrounds, the more powerful types, such as those from Strixhaven, which would give access to the Strixhaven Initiate feat. This, this feat, among other things, uh, lets those from Lorehold, Quandrix, or Witherbloom choose a first level spell from the Wizard spell list. And we know what we're going to take, don't we? The Astral Drifter from Spelljammer and the Rewarded from the Book of Many Things can also give Magic Initiate, and we already know what we can do with that. Interesting little fact. There is a list of familiars to choose from, true, unless you're a warlock. You, you gotta stick to that list. But some of the adventure books add additional creatures to that list. For example, the Baldur's Gate Descent into Avernus Adventure adds the Tressum to the familiar options, with the DM's permission, of course. A Tressum is a winged cat that can see invisible creatures. Also, in the Tomb of Annihilation Adventure, you're introduced to the absolutely adorable flying monkey that can, of course, fly, and it has hands so it can manipulate things like opening windows and doors or shove a potion down your throat. Number three, familiars. Wait, didn't we just talk about familiars? Well, you'll come by these familiars a little differently. If you were to take a gander through the monster manual and happen upon an entry for, I don't know, the imp, you might see this little green text box with some interesting information about it. We could make some sort of pact with this creature and gain some benefits. We would maintain a telepathic bond with each other, and we would sense what the imp senses if we were within a mile of each other. Most importantly, if the imp is within 10 feet of us, sitting on our shoulder or something, we get the benefits of their magic resistance, which is just crazy. The magic resistance of this creature gives you advantage on saving throws against spells and any magic effects. For comparison, a 14th level Abjuration Wizard gets magic resistance that only protects them against spells, though they do get resistance to spell damage as well. A Mantle of Spell Resistance is a rare magic item that requires attunement and it also gives protection only against spells. This is a pretty big ability. We can make similar packs with Quasits and Pseudo-Dragons, but the Pseudo-Dragon is definitely the weaker of the three. Also, it is less likely to steal your soul or eat your face, so there's that. Imps and Quasits, in addition to magic resistance, can also shapeshift into a variety of creatures and turn it invisible. They can be pretty tough with damage resistances and condition immunities. Even the Pseudo-Dragon can telepathically communicate with others and has blind sight. Be aware that this sort of familiar requires a heavy buy-in from your DM and some neg negotiations on the part of the pact. It's a very strong ability that doesn't require much expenditure of resources from the player. So don't be surprised if your DM puts the brakes on this one. Number four, class mechanics. Your class ultimately makes up the majority of what a character can do. And some of them give a cute but fierce companion to keep us company. Now we're not talking about summoning spells here, with maybe one exception. So we're not conjuring animals, summoning fey or demons, none of that. Those only last for so long before they go away. I'm not even going to count spells like Animate Dead, even though the undead we you create are technically permanent, mostly because we have to continue casting these spells every day to maintain control over them. We want as permanent as we can get. But classes, specifically some subclasses, can give us some interesting pet options. With the Artificer, we have the Battlesmith and their Steel Defender. The Steel Defender is essentially a robotic dog, though it can have a more humanoid form if you want. They scale by your proficiency bonus, have a 15 AC, it's not bad. About 20 hit points when you first get them, but that can go all the way up to 107. And they do force damage when they attack. They can't be surprised. They're immune to poison, charmed, and exhaustion, and the poison condition. They can self-heal a couple times a day or be healed by the Mending Cantrip. 
They also have this deflect attack, which is a soft taunt that allows the defender to use their reaction to impose disadvantage on attack rolls by an enemy that isn't targeted against the defender itself. It does require your bonus action to command them in combat. It can move and use this reaction on its own, but it only takes a dodge action unless you tell it otherwise. But that's only in combat. Outside of combat, they can do what they like. Also with the artificers, there is an infusion that creates a homunculus servant. It follows a lot of the same rules as the steel defender, still requiring your bonus action to command in combat, but out of combat, it can do whatever. They have some advantages over the defender. They're tiny, so they can get into small places. They can fly, which means they can get into small, hard to reach places. And they have a ranged attack that does force damage. Not a lot of damage, but still some. And from a distance of that, the paladin doesn't get any pets by themselves, but they do get access to a couple of spells that can do the same thing. Fine Steed is a second level spell exclusive to the paladin, though bards could steal it if they wished. It takes 10 minutes to cast and gives you a permanent mount, such as a camel, an elk, or a warhorse. Yes, these are creatures that you could technically buy anyway, but a warhorse costs 400 gold, and if it died, you have to buy another one. With this spell, you just have to cast the spell again. And the mount you summon is permanent. It hangs around until it's destroyed, or you dismiss it. Then you can just spin another second level spell slot to summon another one. They do count as celestial fey or fiends instead of beasts, which gives you, you know, some minor protection. But does open them up to banishment, not that that's a huge concern. There's also the 4th level greater variant of this spell, which is pretty much the same as the lesser version. But you can instead summon creatures like the Pegasus or the Griffin, both of which can fly with you on them. Now it doesn't seem like mounts can fight while you ride them, but these mounts have an intelligence of at least 6, making them quite a bit smarter than their normal cousins. So you could dismount from your steed, and if someone attacked them while you were fighting, there's nothing to say they won't defend themselves. Talk to your DM first to see how they want to play with mounted combat. There are also some benefits for the mount as well. Any spell that targets only you, the mount could benefit from as well. So healing, shield spell, heroism. Yeah, you can buff that mount and yourself up pretty good. And finally, there's the ranger subclasses for the Beastmaster and the Drake Warden. That's the new Beastmaster from Tasha's. The old one's difficult to use to say the least. The rules for them are very similar to those of the Artificer Steel Defender with needing to use your bonus action to command another combat. The Beastmaster's Primal Companion has three types. The Beast of the Land has the Climb Speed, does extra damage on a charge, and probably hits the hardest of the three. Beast of the Sea has a Swim Speed, of course, can breathe underwater, and can grapple when it attacks which means it can drown enemies pretty effectively. It's a bit niche, but when it comes in handy, woo! The Beast of the Sky is probably the most fragile of them, but it can fly, and it can, has the flyby feature, meaning it can swoop down, strike, and fly away without provoking the attacks of opportunity. The Drake Warden summons a little dragon to fight with them. It follows, again, the same rules as the above examples. It's a pretty tough creature, and in addition to attacking, it can buff the damage of its allies that fight close to them. This subclass is all about the drake. As they gain levels, the drake will gain a breath weapon, gets bigger, and eventually is able to fly with you on it. <laughs> Number five, sidekicks. This one is definitely going to require buy-in from your DM, so consult with them before you try to rope this in. I mean, yes, you could say that about most things, but this one in particular needs DM permission. Sidekicks were introduced in the Essentials Kit, and later again in Tasha's Call to Learn Everything. They were mostly meant for some parties that might lack some element for adventuring, or even like one-on-one -on -one sessions. But of course, it can be used with larger groups as well. When the group finds some adorable NPC they want to adopt, they could use this system to make that NPC more survivable and more useful as the party grows in power because the sidekick will level up with them. The NPC could be any creature that has a CR of one half or less. So we're talking like 
hobgoblins, thugs, satyrs, even a warhorse. They choose a specialized sidekick class, of which there are three. They have levels equal to the average level of the group, and level up when they do. The first class is the expert, which is essentially a pared down rogue. This is a very flexible and supportive class. They start with five skills and can take the help action as a bonus action. As they level up, they get more roguish abilities like cunning action, reliable talent, expertise, even evasion. The sixth level, or coordinated strike, allows a sidekick, when they use the help action, to aid an ally in attacking an enemy, to add an additional 2d6 damage when the sidekick attacks that enemy. I think scouts make pretty good experts, as does the thug. Thugs are already, already have multi-attack and a lot of hit points, which makes them very well-rounded for this class. The spellcaster lets the sidekick cast spells at a similar rate to an artificer, basically half-casters with cantrips. But what kind of spells? Well, that depends on which ability score you decide is the casting stat. If you choose intelligence, Take from the wizard's list. Wisdom takes from both the cleric and the druid, and charisma from the bard and the warlock. And I think that is where I would probably go. There isn't too much to this class. It's probably, it's mostly about the magic. They do get potent cantrip at 6th level, allowing you to add your spellcasting modifier to cantrip damage. This pairs particularly well with Eldritch Blast. The satyr would do pretty well for this class, but I actually think might look a little lower on the CR table to choose the Noble. In addition to already being able to use medium armor and rapiers with the parry feature to up their armor class, they have a 16 in charisma, and that puts them in a pretty good starting spot. Finally, the Warrior is essentially a pared-down fighter. They get armor and weapon proficiencies, a fighter's second wind, and the fighter champions improve critical. They do get extra attack at 6th level, so they should be able to keep up when needed. The Hobgoblin, I think, works well with this class with their martial advantage, allowing them to add an additional 2 to 6 damage to an attack that has an ally beside the enemy. But I think my favorite would still be the Warhorse, just for this image. You should know that this is the strangest thing I've ever done! That way you can ride around in your mount with assurance that it can definitely fight alongside you. So there are some ways that you can get pets to have as your companion in D&D 5e. I'm sure I missed several of them. Put your ideas in the comments below. Be sure to subscribe, share, smash that like button, check out our other videos over here, and I'll see you in the parlor.